One of the things that I've seen in e-commerce is really most e-commerce brands tend to optimize their ad spend around return on ad spend or ROAS. Mm -hmm. And it's a helpful metric for sure. Brands like it. I'm a marketer. I like it because it's something I can easily measure and I don't need to talk to anybody else in the company. And also it tends to be popular because that's how agencies very often face their fees is around return on ad spend. When you're a really small brand and you're single channel, you can get away with not having a solution like this because, for example, if your website is on Shopify, Shopify has a lot of really good native tools that tell you much of what we can tell you. But there are elements that we have on top of it, like the AI, that are different. This podcast is brought to you by Bambassadors.com the go-to platform for e-commerce brands to create video reviews that boost social proof and sales on TikTok and beyond. Get your first video review created and posted by a genuine creator, completely free, no strings attached, and no credit card required at bambassadors.com. Welcome to the Ecom X Factor podcast, where it's all about launching and scaling your business using sales funnels, automations, and smart marketing. And now, please welcome your host, the founder of Ecom X Factor, Yaron Bin. Hey, Kathleen, how are you? I'm great, thanks, Yaron. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. I think you're the first guest that comes for the second episode, and I'm really excited because the first episode was really mind-blowing. It was uh, about the topics that I wasn't aware of. And I'm obviously looking forward to our conversation today, which is about a very highly relevant uh, topic. So it's going to be amazing, I'm, I'm sure. Can you tell the listeners that maybe didn't listen to our first episode or in general, what is your background and what are you doing these days? So my name is Kathleen Booth. I'm a Senior Vice President of Marketing at Tradeswell, which is makes an e-commerce operating system. And what that means is we help e-commerce brands pull all of their data in from all their most critical sales, retail, marketing, finance, and operations channels. We unify it at the SKU and category level, and we surface actionable insights to help you grow more profitably. I have been in e-commerce for several years. I actually used to own a marketing agency. Prior to this, I was with another company called Clean.io which is when I spoke to you last time. And so I've been focused for a while on helping e-commerce brands get deeper insights into their data so that they can make better decisions to, to drive more profitable growth. Can you elaborate about what Tradeswell is doing? Sure. So Tradeswell, as I mentioned, we call it an e-commerce operating system, and it's really something very new, I think, in the industry. So right now we're integrated with most of the D2C, largest D2C and uh, marketplace channels that e-commerce brands sell on. So Shopify, BigCommerce, Amazon, Target, Walmart, Ulta Beauty. And what we're really trying to do is solve for the complexity of multi-channel data. And, you know, I don't have to tell you or your listeners that today so many brands are selling cross-channel. There's so much opportunity out there right now. And it's easier than it's ever been to, you know, experiment with these different channels, but it's very hard, you know, with that opportunity comes a lot of complexity and it's very hard to pull all your data in and make sense of it. And so what winds up happening more often than not is people from within e-commerce brands get lost in spreadsheets. You know, they're trying to pull everything into one place and compare apples to apples. And that is much more difficult than it should be. And that's really because... So many of these marketplaces have their own rules for how they like to present products and data. And, you know, what is a SKU on your Shopify site might be an ASIN on Amazon. You know, there's all, even the product numbers are different. And then when you layer on top of that, the fact that you have all these different marketing channels, you know, you've got Facebook and Google and Klaviyo and TikTok and Snap and Pinterest, and it keeps going on and on. And all of those platforms also kind of have their own way of presenting data. You know, and really what all this boils down to is the fact that as a brand, you should really own your data. But unfortunately, the channels tend to have so much control over it. And it it just makes it hard for you to pull it in in a way that's meaningful for your own way of making decisions and your own way of analyzing your business. And that's really what we're trying to solve for. Can you maybe tell us who are your competitors? Because I'm trying to figure out if it's more like a high or platform like this that help us like 
like attribution pixel stuff, a claim to help with the uh, pixel stuff or more like Tableau or data visualization uh, program software. So where are you guys on this spectrum or, or do you do everything? Yeah, this is such a good question. And this is why we call it an e-commerce operating system because it's really, I think, impossible to fit us into any existing box. And so mm-hmm. we're actually a little bit like a snowflake, like a mm-hmm. data lake. Because we pull in so much data and we normalize it at the SKU level, like we're able to pull in your sales data from Amazon and Shopify and Walmart. And even though those all have different product numbers, we pull it in and we have an AI that maps it on the back end and creates one single product graph that you can see your performance, you know, for any individual widget you're selling, you can see how it's performing across all channels in one place. So it's a little bit like, You know, in the marketing world, we talk about customer data platforms, CDPs. This is a little bit like a product data platform, which is different than a PIM. A lot of people ask me, is it a PIM? Mm -hmm. And it's not really because it's not a content management system. We're not pushing product listings out to these platforms. Mm -hmm. We are truly like a product data platform where we pull the data in, we normalize it. But we're more than that because we have this AI layer that not only do we surface the data in very easy to digest dashboards, but then the AI goes in and it analyzes your performance. So when you log in, it'll say things like you should increase your bid for this product on Amazon because you're not optimizing your sales results or, you know, you have an opportunity to win the buy box here by doing this, or you should stop advertising that product because you're going to run out of inventory. And so what we're really working towards is becoming eventually a system of automation where the Mm -hmm. platform will do some of these things for you and effectively save your time. And And what's most critical about all of this is that, you know, I started talking in the beginning about the complexity of data and all these different platforms and how they control it. But the other aspect to it is that they're all algorithmic, right? Like Google, Facebook, et cetera. These are algorithmic marketing platforms where an algorithm is deciding, you know, what ad gets shown and who sees it and and all these things. And then On the other end, marketplaces are also algorithmic. You know, Amazon, Walmart, et cetera, they have algorithms that decide whose product winds up in the buy box, whose product winds up at the top of the listing. Algorithms move fast. They move faster than human brains can. And so part of what you have to solve for isn't just having good visibility into the data. It's moving really quickly to action so that you're able to optimize at the same pace as the algorithms are making their decisions. And that's how you really win in this kind of algorithmic world. We're a little bit data lake. We're a little bit BI and analytics. And then we call it an operating system because we're layering these actions on top of all of that and really helping you run your business. Mm-hmm. Do you mind sharing any case studies or any clients who onboarded recently and what were like the recommendations that they got from the AI and what lifts did you see? How did it impact the, their business? And what was the time frame that it, that it impact immediately? Does it take the algorithm time to learn? I'm happy to hear more about like case studies. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start out broad and then I'll give you an example. So I would say we we look at all of our customers' data and we have more than 500 brands on the platform from very small D2C brands all the way up to one of our customers is the largest single seller account on Amazon. Mm-hmm. So we have access to a lot of different data. In terms of, you asked how long does it take? So you can use Tradeswell and get set up within 24 hours and within 48 hours have up to two years of historical data in mm-hmm. the system. And so it's really quick to get it set up. And the AI is also really fast because it's, you know, it's been learning across and that's the benefit of having all these different brands on the platform is Mm -hmm. it sees the performance across the brands and it's able to apply that learning to every individual account. So the speed is there just in terms of, and, and I would say across the board, we've also studied how our customers like net margin grows and how their business overall grows. And the numbers are pretty significant in terms of what happens once they start onboarding with the platform. Now, a concrete example of how this manifests. So we had a client that wanted to know if lightning sales drive incremental revenue or if they cannibalize existing sales. Mm -hmm. So effectively, they were trying to decide if their you know, ability to drive new business would determine whether they should continue making investment in lightning sales promotional strategies. Mm -hmm. And so they use, we have something within the platform called a retail channels, and that looks at cumulative performance by channel. 
And they were able to look in there and sort by new versus repeat customers. And because we have cross-channel cohort analysis and LTV and things along those lines. And they, they discovered from looking at their data and the platform that lightning sales actually did result in an overall spike in sales for the days when they were held, mm -hmm. but also that those sales were heavily weighted towards net new customers. Mm -hmm. And so using that kind of data, they could demonstrate internally to the rest of their team that, that the lightning sales as a promotional strategy was driving incrementality. They were able to secure additional budget for future lightning sales deals and overall, you know, optimize their business around incremental sales and, and new customer acquisition, et cetera. Now that's one example of just like leveraging the data. I think in terms of the AI more specifically, where we see it is it's surfaced in the smaller decisions that I think drive the everyday business. And so it is around adjusting bid prices so mm -hmm. that you're optimizing for that. It is around because we pull in for Amazon and Walmart and some of those other platforms, we pull in inventory data. It's around knowing how to throttle your ad spend based on inventory availability. And then the other piece of data we pull in is cost of goods sold. And so one of the things that I've seen in e-commerce is really most e-commerce brands tend to optimize their ad spend around return on ad spend or ROAS. Mm -hmm. And it's a helpful metric for sure. Brands like it. I'm a marketer. I like it because it's something I can easily measure and I don't need to talk to anybody else in the company. And also it tends to be popular because that's how agencies very often face their fees is around mm -hmm. return on ad spend. Unfortunately, though, return on ad spend tells only part of the story and it doesn't really speak to bottom line profit. It just speaks to top line revenue. And so because we pull in cost of goods sold, what we're really trying to evangelize is that brands need to, they should look at ROAS, but they should also look at what we call net margin contribution, which is, you know, not only what is the top line revenue that an ad that a dollar of advertising is driving, like hopefully it's positive, but how much is it contributing to your bottom line? Because it is very possible to have positive ROAS, but still be losing money on that product. And sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad, right? Like that product might be a loss leader, which is fine if it's driving sales down the road, or it just might be a loss maker mm -hmm. <laughs> all around. And so having good visibility into this is so important. And brands all have different objectives. There are definitely brands that don't care that much about profit, especially if they they have venture capital that's backing them. Sometimes it's growth at all costs. So great, fine, optimize for that, but do it with full information is kind of what we're all about. Mm -hmm. Based on what you said, I mean, you only chose one example, but, but based on this example, it kind of got me feeling that this is more relevant to bigger brands that are doing multi-channel. But do you think that you, your solution is also suitable for, for people who have like running Facebook ads to the Shopify store, even in big scale, but not, not a running, not multi-channel and not uh, inventory in marketplaces and in personal stores? Quick favor, guys. If you enjoy these shows and have been a listener for quite some time now, we would really, really appreciate it if you could take the time to give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your preferred podcast app may be. Having lots of ratings and audience feedback makes our show become more visible across multiple platforms. And it also supports our mission of helping as many people as possible to become better marketers and better entrepreneurs. So if you're not driving and it wouldn't be dangerous, pause this thing right now and give us an honest review over your podcast app. And we will love you even more than we already do. Thank you for taking the time and I hope you enjoyed the show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have made the product and it's designed so that anybody can use it. In fact, I think our lowest pricing tier is $99 a month. So it's very accessible to mm -hmm. anyone. And here's what I would say. When you're a really small brand and you're single channel, you can get away with not having a solution like this. Because for example, if your website is on Shopify, Shopify has a lot of really good native tools that tell you much of what we can tell you. But and there are elements that we have on top of it, like the AI that are different. Where I think investing in trades will make sense at, at early stages is that we're a platform that truly grows with your business. And so, I mean, again, I'm a marketer and I know how hard it is to put in place like a tech stack and to connect all these different things. And I always liken changing tech solutions to like changing banks or cable companies. It's mm -hmm. so much harder than it needs to be. And so we've really tried to build the platform so that you, you could start on it as a single channel Shopify D2C brand. And, and, you know, this is a 
platform that five, 10 years down the road, when you're doing tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in sales, it should be able to grow with you the entire way. So you're not having to rip something out and replace it. Can you share what are the risks of not having this platform? I mean, okay, people might be thinking, okay, I have uh, discovered because I started with a Shopify store, but what are, what are they missing? We did a survey last year. We actually hired a third-party research firm mm -hmm. to come in and because we wanted to understand more deeply the challenges that e-commerce brands were facing and also what they thought they were going to need to succeed in the future. And um, so we surveyed more than 300 e-commerce leaders. And what we learned was that more than 80% of them said that access to unified data was a key barrier to their ability to succeed. And chief amongst the 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 ways that manifested in terms of pain was not being able to best understand and optimize their ad spend. There are a lot of other ways that unified data can help. Um, and so that ad spend optimization, I think is, it's the canary in the coal mine, as I like to say, like it's the first thing, it's the most obvious thing that brands see because, you know, especially in the last two years, when you look at what's happened with Facebook and, and rising customer acquisition costs as a result of changes in iOS. And then, you know, you layer on top all the supply chain issues that are happening, et cetera. The ad spend thing is the most visible pain point, but there's other deeper, subtler ways that this affects the business. And it has to, it does have to do with things like supply chain. And it also has to do with like the time, the time that brands spend trying to make sense of the data. So what we found out through the survey was that on average, e-commerce teams spend a day a week trying to sort through and make sense of data. And so when you think about the potential period of economic contraction that we're coming into, what I'm hearing from all of my marketing peers is kind of this note of caution that we're not yet really cutting a lot, but what we are doing is we're not increasing our investment. We might be, we, we're not like laying anybody off, but we're also not hiring any, anybody new. And so the theme right now, while we're all trying to figure out what's going to happen is how can we do more with what we have right now? And so mm -hmm. if you consider that one day a week or 20% of a team's time is spent on making sense of data, if you can eliminate that time, you get 20% more time from your team to focus on higher value things like you know, product strategy and this the kind of stuff that really makes a difference in terms of your ability to compete and win. Um, and so, so that 80% plus of, of e-commerce leaders said data unification is so important. The other two themes that really emerged from the survey were alignment and speed. So having your data in one place, <clears throat> speed is about moving faster from analysis to decision. Because the uh, it's funny, the thing we heard a lot was we don't want more data, right? Which I don't know, like I have a hard time when I hear that and I'm always like, oh, really? But the, what they're really saying isn't I don't want more data. It's I don't want to spend more time trying to figure mm -hmm. data out. They want more insights, yeah, exactly. not just more raw data. And so that's about that speed issue. Like I want to be able to make better decisions faster. And then the last one was alignment, which is, you know, and this goes back to my point about ROAS, we pick ROAS as our metric because we as marketers can figure it out on our own and we can report on it and it's easy. But the best decisions for e-commerce brands happen when you have greater alignment amongst your team and better visibility cross-functionally into the data. So when you are, as the head of marketing, sitting down with the head of finance and the head of operations and the head of retail, and you're looking at it all in one picture and you're all looking at the same data sets and dashboards. And so those are the kinds of things I think brands need to think about. Out and and we sort of plotted it along this e-commerce maturity model. And you can start to grade yourself about where you are and how prepared you are to succeed in the future along those three lines of data unification, alignment, and speed. This is very interesting. Uh, I like the I, I really like the point regarding the fact that people don't want more data because when you spoke about the fact that uh, teams said that they spent 20%. I thought about the other problem that some people don't know, some, some teams don't know where to look and don't know how yeah. to take the important data because it's hard <laughs> taking over a lot of data, like conquering a lot of data. So the fact, as, as you mentioned, it's such a crucial understanding that we want more insights. We don't want more data. We just want more insights. And this is very powerful. Uh, so it's a great point for sure. Yeah, and I think you raised something interesting, which is almost the the other end of that, 
you know, there's, there's having enough data and having enough insights to make the right decisions. And then, and I think, again, as a marketer, I, I know that we fall victim to this a lot. There's a tendency on the part of some people to, to look at too much data. And the question I always ask is like, what would you do differently if you had the answer to that question? Because sometimes marketers get lost in measuring mm -hmm. everything, even if, even if it doesn't need to be measured. And so there is that right balance to strike of, having having the right data but and extracting the right insights to help make the best decisions mm -hmm. yeah for sure when i dive into the data i sometimes i very often get lost and I'm, I'm wondering do you have some sort of a recommendation regarding how to prioritize the insights well i think that's that's about the what what our ai does mm -hmm. is when you when you log in you know we we try to surface the things that are going to make the biggest difference mm -hmm. or, okay. you know, the biggest bang for the buck, if you will. And so you'll come in and they'll, they'll be there front and center. And literally you can consider it like a checklist and you kind of go down the line. Are those all of the things you should be doing to optimize your business? Absolutely not. I mean, our goal is to continue adding more insights all the time so that we can, you know, make it as actionable as possible. They certainly are, you know, amongst the highest priority ones. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I wanted to ask you a bit to zoom out since you're seeing so many accounts and you you oversee so much data. Is there any interesting trends that you've been noticing or any any interesting insights that surprised you in the last uh, five months since you joined joined Tradewell Trade and uh, got exposed to so much data? Yeah. So actually, it's I'm glad you asked that because mm -hmm. we just published our first ever quarterly data report where we're pulling all this data in and we're going to do this every quarter nice. and we study essentially what are the things we can learn looking across the data of 500 plus brands and there are a ton of interesting insights some of which are going to be very intuitive like for example coming out of the pandemic one of the industries that's performing the best is baby products. And that's honestly because people made a lot of babies during COVID, right? <laughs> like, and, and beauty, now that we're going back into the world and we're not wearing masks, everybody's buying makeup. So there are some things that are not surprising. One of the things that I thought was the most interesting is we actually created a new metric that I think is fairly unique. I haven't seen anybody else mm -hmm. report on this. And we're trying to answer the question, how many products do I need to sell in a given marketplace to make the same net margin I'm making on my D2C site? Mm -hmm. Because we always hear e-commerce brands talking about how margins are thin on marketplaces, but it's all sort of anecdotal. And so what we looked at across all of our customers was for every, and we did it, we started with just Shopify and Amazon for every product that you sell on Shopify how many of the same product do you need to sell on Amazon to make the same net margin? And the answer I think might surprise people, it was 1.08. So for every 100 widgets mm -hmm. that they're selling D2C on Shopify, they need to sell 108 on Amazon to get the same profit at the end of the day, which surprised me. I thought it would be more. I thought Amazon would be less profitable. And so when you factor in the dramatic expansion of reach that you gain on Amazon, to me, that's that's a very interesting story that it's not as many as you might think to recoup that same profit. And so what we're going to be doing moving forward is looking more broadly at that same metric and doing it across more marketplaces and more D2C sites so that we can really begin to make it a decisioning tool for a brand that maybe is selling D2C and is thinking about going into marketplaces and the objective eventually is to be able to say, if it's 1.08 on Amazon, it might be, I'm going to make numbers up here, 1.07 on Walmart and 1.9 on Target. And so that should help brands make a decision about if they need to move into a marketplace, which one should they go to? But I'm wondering if it's relevant also, um, do you factor in also the, the retention and the lifetime value? Because one of the advantages of not selling on Amazon is the fact that you control the customer and the emails and you can the lifetime value might be higher. So did, did, did you take this into consideration or are we talking about only like first-time buyers? Yeah, so, so right now we haven't taken LTV into consideration, but that's one of the things that as we, because we're going to publish this every quarter, mm -hmm. we anticipate layering more data on top of it. So I love the idea of that, adding that into the mix and looking at how that affects LTV. So maybe you'll see that next quarter. <laughs> awesome. I'm looking forward. Cool. Uh, is there anything that I, I you would like to mention or something that I was supposed to ask and I forgot to ask? 
Oh gosh. I mean, there's so much I always like to talk about. I, I think, I, I guess, um, you know, for me, the biggest thing that I would just encourage anybody listening to think about is, you know, obviously I think trades well is great, but, but I'm not here just to promote a platform. I think I'm here to promote a mindset, which is having full visibility into your data, um, especially as you begin to go multi-channel and not being afraid to get aligned with the rest of your team and making sure that folks in finance and operations and retail and marketing are all looking at the same data sets so that you can move faster and make better decisions. You know, of course, if somebody does want to learn more about Tradeswell, we do offer a 30 day free trial. So, um, you know, we're happy to let you get in there and kick the tires. Um, and we're releasing new integrations all the time. We just this last week released a Walmart fulfillment services integration. This week we're releasing TikTok and Snap. We have Pinterest coming up pretty soon. Um, so very exciting stuff there. And then you can also go to our website, tradeswell.com, and you'll find we have a page on our research and you can download any of our research reports if you want to see more about the data I talked about. Awesome. I'm looking forward to, to reading the, this report and I, we are going to share the link uh, in the show notes. And I want to encourage the listeners to check uh, out your solution because for me, I feel that whenever I stop tracking and I lose touch with the data, this, this is a red flag because once you stop tracking, after a few weeks, it's already hard to go back and, and look at the data, <laughs> especially for example even in personal stuff like not looking at your bank account or not tracking your weight as soon as you stop measuring and then you you become afraid on looking at the data <laughs> honestly so this is a big issue so i think that the fact that you make it so accessible and provide insights is something that people shouldn't overlook and i think that your solution is awesome and i'm going to check it out on my personal stores as well well i'd love to hear what you think i'm always i'm always looking for feedback so and if you're listening and you check it out i'd love to hear your feedback too you can i'm very active on both linkedin and twitter so don't hesitate to dm me if you have any thoughts about it thank you so much kathleen have a lovely rest of your day take care thanks so much Aaron. bye bye Hi guys, this is Yaron again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, if you want to learn more about e-commerce and marketing, make sure you check out our YouTube channel, which is called Ecom X Factor Official. Number two, check out our Facebook group, which is called Ecom X Factor Marketing and E-commerce Mastermind. This is a great place to ask questions and connect with other business owners. And last but not least, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to share it with your friends and colleagues. Plus, leave a review at your favorite podcast app. 